Good morning, everyone. Good evening, um, wherever you are, and um, welcome to another Moth webinar. Um, this week, the aim is to touch on the, the history of the Moth class. And um, one thing for sure is, since I sort of dug into this a little bit, it's a real Pandora's box, and um, very hard to uh, to really you know bring all the, the true facts together. So we're going to do our best with with the people we've got with us online here. And um, we'll, um, you know, share as much knowledge with you as possible. So first of all, let me introduce our four guests. Uh, Peter Moore, 1975 world champion. Um, I've known Peter for a number of years now from being race officer at the Extreme 40 uh, race circuit. And then it turned out he was a moth sailor. So, um, and he's obviously still in the class now. Uh, Simon Payne, uh, who most people will be familiar with in the moth class two-time world champion and long-time uh, stalwart of the class. Not saving the moth anymore, but um, probably would like to get back in. Rowan Veal, again, needs no introduction. Um, he, you know, well, certainly in my mind, started the, the foiling revolution. He didn't invent the kit, but he was certainly uh, the first guy up on foils and, and doing, uh, doing what we all do now. And then Les Thorpe, or last but not least Les, uh, again, in the class forever, um, probably saving him since he was in his teens. And uh, he's done the low riding, he's done the foiling. He's probably seen all the highs and lows of the class throughout the years and, and has more knowledge than probably any one of the class. Um, so j just briefly before we uh, get into Peter, where did this moth class all start? And, um, the, you know, the truth of it is, you know, it, it's, there's, you know, we're lucky in that the class, we've got so much history. And um, what one, one thing we will be clear here is that we don't bring it all together clearly, um, or as clearly as we could, but that's probably for another day, really digging into the 1930s, the 1940s, and 1950s, where the different pockets of boats around the world um, were sailing under different rules. Um, but one of the main players in bringing it all together was Major Tony Hibbert, who in, in the 1950s and 1960s realized that around the world there were these different classes, um, all quite similar, but not under any umbrella. So um, he was able to talk to these various classes. Obviously in the UK, it was the British moth, which then became the Europe dinghy. Over here, there was a moth class. And then in America, another class, which may have even had a spinnaker at one stage but he was able to sort of bring them all together and um, form, as we know now, IMCA, International Moth Class Association, Class Association, formed in 1972. And obviously around a similar time is the Carling Cup, which is our World Championship Trophy, uh, which we still race for today. So that was formed early 70s. Um, and from there, you know, the rules were sort of brought under one umbrella. And obviously they've changed a, a little along the way. But um, I think a, a lot of the class is, is due to ma Major Tony Hibbert for um, bringing it all together. So uh, we'll move on uh, to our first guest, Peter Moore, um, world champion 1975. Um, there he is on the right here, still sailing moths today. Um, probably, probably been out this week, I'd imagine. But um, Peter, thank you for joining us and tell us, you know, what got you into moth sailing in the 70s or 60s when you started? Yes, uh, thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, I, I started um, sailing, in, uh, sailing moths in 1960. Oh, well, I started building my first of about 12 boats in 1966. Um, I built, uh, first of all, I built uh, two mouldy moths, which were round bilge, coal moulded boats that were very popular in Australia in the 60s. Um, uh, they were diagonally planked over a mould that the association, the, the local association, would make available to home builders. Most of the boats in those days were home built. Uh, the mouldies were uh, three layers of diagonally planked Australian red cedar, very thin, very strong, very light, but they took forever to build. Uh, my first boat took me two years to build and the second one took a year to build. Um, I'd been sailing fireballs, uh, a friend's fireball that was um, 
we'd won a couple of Australian and state championships. So I was attracted to scows. The Fireball was a two-man scow that was designed in the UK. And uh, I was at uni at the time and didn't have any money and moths were very cheap. And there were a lot of them sailing in Australia. In Sydney alone, there were about 12 clubs. Every state had them. And uh, there were so many boats that you had to sail in selection trials to get to uh, to to get into a team to go to the Australian Championships. So, so the moth was essentially a, a, a cheap and easy class to get into. And, very cheap. Um, yeah, so very... literally, you phoned up. So, how would the the moulds were what similar to what we'd see now? The mould for a boat, a, a fiberglass mould or a wooden mould? No, the the moulds were uh, for the mouldies. Were the moulds were. Uh, timber stringers, a male mould, um, and you wrap the veneers around the mould with the boat upside down. Oh, yes. so you had, you had, you had a, a male a male mould and then you just bent wood over it. Yeah. Glued yeah, it all up. The veneers were very thin. They were only about one and a half millimetres thick. So they were diagonally planked from the centre out to the gunnel. And uh, you put three layers alternating the direction. And how many moulds did the class association have then? Uh, I don't. I don't remember. The first two mouldies that I built were two different shapes mouldies. So, but I don't remember. There must have been a lot of them because they were being built in most states. Although in Western Australia and Perth, most of the moths in the 60s were double chine boats, as you can see here on the right. Uh, the fiberglass one that's in the middle there. Yeah. Uh, John Ebden and. Um, Rick Lepastria uh, were sailing in the mid 60s, uh, were sort of a round, round bills version of the Maldi, but they were fairly heavy and uh, I don't think that, and, and, and a very hollow hull, like a tunnel hull. Uh, I don't think they were very successful. By the, by so, the, how heavy were these wooden boats you were building? I'm sorry? How heavy were the wooden boats you were building? Uh, well, I'm not too sure. I don't think I ever weighed the Maldives. They were pretty light. I know my later boats were about 25 kilograms. So um, they were pretty light. The, um, the double chine boats were easier to build and lighter. I, well, I, I'm not too sure about that because it, we didn't ever, didn't ever weigh them, I think. A few photos. I mean, you can probably put a generation on some of these photos here. Peter, but they they actually this looks later generation these they're not scow bound but no they're all scows in that picture and that's oh, they... um that'd be in the mid 60s yeah uh, so... because the um the sale numbers the sale numbers indicate that it was before we became an international class in 68 1968 so the the boats with the twos at the beginning 2000 boats were new south wales 3,000 boats were from Victoria, 4,000 boats were from Queensland, and 5,000 boats were from South Australia, and 6,000 boats were from uh, Western Australia. Got you, got you. I noticed down in the bottom right here, there's a lady sailing a, sailing a moth. Did you have many female competitors back then? Uh, not in the 60s. Uh, no. Later on in the early 70s, we had uh, a few girls. Um, one of them was Vanessa Dudley, who went on to be uh, very successful in lasers and still sells lasers now. Got you, got you. Um, so this was, you know, something you pointed out to me, and and I've had a bit of feedback feedback on um, these walking stick rigs, as you called it, which is as close to well, it's closer to what we use now and the pocket loft. Tell us a bit about what was going on there with the rig developments and, and where you ended up. Presumably you're on aluminium masts, are you, or is this now into carbon or glass? No, the, these uh, these uh, sails were developed in the mid-1960s by uh, a couple of brothers from Seaforth Moth Club, which was one of the uh, popular strong moth clubs at the time uh, in Sydney. Uh, John and David Bowen's father was an aeronautical engineer and he came up with this very sophisticated um, pocket loft sail, uh, walking stick. They were timber masts and uh, a pain in the neck to rig up and uh, quite complicated and uh, they were later um, 
we, we later moved to a, a square top sail, which was on a straight mast, uh, which were easier to rig and a bit simpler. Uh, the boat on the left, 2411, won the Australian Championships in um, Hobart in about, I think it was about 1968. And it's a mouldy moth with a sort of a manta ray bow. The other boats are square top pocket luffs. The interesting thing is that by, by the early 70s, the, um, we'd all gone back to conventional sails. They were more versatile, I think, and actually they were, we, were, we were going quicker with a conventional sail than with these early pocket luff sails. And so how did you rig these pocket luff sails? Let's forget about the walking stick, because that does look complicated to push in. But <laughs> did you have cams or anything, or you just push it in the no, push it in the top? No, there were no cams. And in those days, there were no fiberglass battens. The, the battens were um, originally split, split cane, uh, but that was too soft. And then we moved to uh, tulip oak battens, timber battens. Uh, which I think were fitted into a bit of plastic conduit on the back of the mast. Got you. And the, and the mast was wood? Uh, so originally they were hollow spruce timber masts, but uh, later on, towards the end of the 60s, we had um, aluminium, aluminium sections at the bottom, and then the top was a hollow spruce uh, timber which were a pain in the neck to make because uh, you had to make them up out of several pieces of timber, make sure they were, they were hollow and you glue them all together and taper them. And you know, it was quite a job. So, and you were doing all this yeah, yourself? We didn't, have, we didn't have TV or computers in those days. So what else did you do at night? No, you couldn't, you couldn't YouTube how to build your moth mast. <laughs> no. no, but the association was very good. There was a lot of information available. That so, uh, picture is my first mouldy moth. Uh, it must have been about 1966, 67, with a square top pocket luff sail. Got you. And, and tell me why, the, you know, obviously scows have been uh, very good boats and very good designs in lots of classes. And um, presumably it's, through, you know, a beamy hull and, and good for stability. Now, if you saw a square boat on the water, people would seriously question it. Um, but in your day, that was the rage. Well, yes, and I, it's interesting that um, in those days we didn't have wings, so I guess the wide scow was a bit easier to manage. And you can see um, on the left there, Peter Holmes in a mouldy moth, a very nice looking um, pocket luff sail. You had to hike pretty hard because you didn't have the wings for leverage, so. Uh, that uh, that meant that um, quite heavy blokes could sail moths competitively and um, they'd do well in the strong breezes and we'd, the lighter blokes would do well in the light breezes. So it, it meant that the class was open to a wide range of weights. Once the wings came in in the 70s, a lot of the heavy blokes found it difficult to be competitive because us light guys were much more competitive in the stronger winds. And, and, the and did, you have, did you find that rigs or different masts or different sails were good for different weights of competitors? Um, not so much. It's just I think that the um, conventional sails were much more versatile, that you could yeah. flatten them out uh, much more in the, um, in the strong winds, just like you do these days with lots of Cunningham and lots of Boomvang. And you could power them up in the lighter, lighter breezes and, and for downwind by letting the foot in and easing off the Cunningham, just exactly the same as you do these days. Got you, got you. And mm. so tell me, this guy top right here building his boat, is yeah. that's not the, that's not the moulded moldy technique you were no, talking that's, about? No, that's a double chine boat, Robbo Sullivan, who was a world champion in 74 and 78, I think. Uh, we all built our boats, at, pretty well all the boats were home built. That's a double chine boat. Uh, Rob was from Perth. Um, the double chines were much easier to build and, and it allowed, unlike the moldies, the, the moulds could be very easily changed. And we did a lot of experimentation in the early 70s for different hull shapes to see which. So there's a lot of varieties of double chine boats, uh, all with their 
strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, this is one of your boats here, is it? Yeah, that's the uh, second Maldi I ever built. Boy, they took a long time to build those things. But yeah, uh, got you. Yeah, beautiful boats. So you just on light winds. Once the wings came in, I think the um, the boats were going faster through the water, so the double chine was more of a planing hull. And, Got it. Uh, double and tell me, Peter, this was your own design? This was the snubby design, was it? No, no. The mouldings were association moulds. We borrowed the moulds from an, borrowed the mould from the association. Got you. And, and built the boat on the mould. The moulds were quite complicated, so it wasn't easy to make changes. And again, this is just a, a mouldy as well, late 60s. No, this is, this is a double chine boat. And okay. um, by, by 1970, nearly all the boats were, were um, double chine. Got you. And was that then with the, the concave, oh, this is the double chine here on the right? Uh, that's right. Now, that, the, on the right is um, Graham Lillingston from Perth. He was the first Australian to go to a world championship. He went to France, I think, with that boat or one similar in 1968 and sailed in Cannes. Um, and um, that championship was won easily by uh, uh, Marie, a girl, Marie Ferreau in a Duflo, which later became the, the model for the um, Europe single-handed Olympic boat. But, um, and Graham, Graham at that 1968 um, Worlds, uh, he finished 14th overall, but um, because obviously most of the races were in light winds and the skips were way dominant in the light winds, but in one race he won easily and there was only about half a dozen boats finished, so I assume that that was a windy race. Yeah, gotcha. Got you. I mean, presumably for him travelling overseas then, he wouldn't have any idea really of what the rest of the fleet was going to look like. He's showing up there with his square boat and everyone else has got a pointy one might have been a bit of a shock i guess i guess but i think um the uh in um 1969 and 1969 the um dave mckay went to america with a scow and won it won the worlds easily who won i think those regattas those championships all depended on whether it was light winds or strong winds the scows were so dominant once it was over 12 or 15 knots and the skiffs were pointy boats as you call them were so dominant under 12 knots and then and then i mean these guys in these boats here look like pretty big lads so obviously uh dave mckay wasn't a particularly big bloke but okay you know, you know, they make up for uh, size and weight by hiking pretty hard yeah got you got you very famous na name of the you know of the past ian brown yeah ian was the um ian was the first uh moth sailor in in australia really to develop the skiff moths and um he won the worlds i think it was 1973 in new zealand i think it was predominantly light wind series uh not my, not many of us went to, to new zealand but um from then on, from the seven, from those days onwards, Ian was uh, sailing skiffs, and uh, there was a lot of um, yeah, debate about which was better, a scow or a skiff. And um, pretty well, it ended up, as I said, if it was over 15 knots, the scows would win easily, and if it was under 50, under 12 knots, the skiffs would win easily. The only time it was a reasonable competition was in that range of about 10 to 15 knots. Got you. And so the, and that, that they were sort of the beamy, beamy skiff hulls, but they all yeah. had wings, did they, then at that stage? Wings started coming in. Uh, the first boat to ever have wings was at the Worlds in 1970 in, um, in, uh, in Melbourne. And there was only one bloke who turned up from Perth, John Russell, with wings on his boat. And uh, we were a bit surprised because... Uh, we didn't realise that the beam rule then was as the same as it is now, seven foot four and a half. Uh, God, you're so saying you guys were all sailing around under under max beam, essentially. 
Yeah, came to me as it, I was only 65 kilograms, so it came to me as a huge surprise to find out that I could have huge wings on the boat. And yeah, I, got you. Uh, that's, so that's, Julie, the people who put the wings on straight away dominated. Absolutely. The, everybody, by the next year, everybody pretty well had wings. And in some ways, that was a bit sad because all the good sailors, good heavyweight sailors, dropped out. And uh, blokes like me and Ian Brown, uh, because we were pretty light guys, we could um, we could hold our own in the strong winds, and we dominated in the light. So, 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 so what did you seven, find that you did? You just put wings straight onto your existing hull, then and literally just make the boat wider. Yeah, they were just aluminium tubes that were bent and uh, dumped on top of the cockpit. Instant boat speed. Yeah, instant boat speed. That's good. And that when was that? That was happening in the early seventies or well, seventy one. You said everyone had wings. Pretty well by seventy one, seventy two, everybody had wings. Oh yeah. And by the end of the seventies, early eighties, the numbers, the class numbers started to drop uh, fairly dramatically. Uh, in the sixties and seventies, we had huge fleets. We had typically. Um, state selection trials would have 70 or 80 boats in, in um, Western Australia and in, in Sydney. Uh, so, um, and the clubs, as I said, Balmoral Sailing Club in Sydney, for example, had 50 or 60 boats racing every Sunday, every, um, every weekend. And there are at least a dozen clubs in Sydney and um, the same in other states. So the numbers fell dramatically in the, in the 80s and 90s. And hey, and Rob, a, uh, a question from, um, from the floor. Was there any, anyone had different width wings depending on uh, the regatta or the uh, event you were going to or even the day you were sailing? Wider for heavier air and, and narrow no. for lighter air? No, the wings were fixed, pretty well fixed to the boats and everyone had maximum seven foot, four and a half. I'm, I'm a bit old fashioned, so that's imperial. I'm not too sure what that is in metrics. Two, two, five, zero. <laughs> I think is where we're at now. This picture on this oh, picture you have right now is uh, John Claridge with a UK Magnum. He was the um, UK national champion, uh, and he came to the 1976 Worlds in America, a very very light wind series. Um, but this <clears throat> but th this you would call a skiff hull. This is a this is the skiff magnum skiff from the UK. Got yeah. And in this picture, you can see that the um, it's a very flat bottom boat with very little rocker, whereas the boat in the background was the typical American boat, which was very, a lot of rocker and very round bottom. It was more of a displacement hull, and uh, because it was a very light wind series, the the displacement hulls um, won easily. And the UK Magnum was not not that uh, not that successful. So, and then 19. Tell us about your World Championship win then in 1975. Where did where did that happen? And you know what kit did you take to that? And what what was going on? Uh, you'll have to go back a few pictures, Rob. I think. Um, I know I've got your your one actually at the end here. Oh, that was 1976, sorry. That was 76, that's the borrowed boat. And yeah, that's 76, you've got to go backwards, I think, uh, Rob. That one? Yeah, that's um, in the Worlds were in Japan in 1975 in Okinawa. And uh, we loaded up a container full of boats from Australia. There was a um, truckload of boats from um, Japan, which were pretty old fashioned and crude scows. There were a few boats from New Zealand. Uh, I think there might've been um, an American boat there as well. I'm not too sure, but it was a windy series and, the, and really it was just a, uh, it was just another Australian championship as far as we were concerned because uh, uh, wind, windy conditions scows, we, uh, we romped away. So, you know, what was your, you, you, pre, you were winning in Australia, obviously, you were state champion and you were- I won the Australians in um, Adelaide the year before 
and yeah. then second year before that in Perth in with Rob O'Sullivan when Rob O'Sullivan won. Uh, we all went, Ian Brown, Rob O'Sullivan, uh, we all went to Japan and uh, it was the first time I'd ever been overseas so it was a big experience for me. Yeah, came back the with the in the hammer. Very light, very light boats, so fairly sophisticated for their day, very high power to weight ratio, beautiful sails, very versatile sails. Yeah. And um, just like today we used a lot of boom vang tension and um, uh, use the Cunningham a lot to flatten out the sail. What, what courses did you race? Windward Lured or? Uh, no, they weren't. They were Triangle, Windward Lured, Triangle. So reaching was very important. Yeah, yeah, got you. And that's probably why this, the scow was pretty good as well for those Absolutely. power ridges. Yeah, yeah, yeah the you. only time the skiffs would be able to compete was on the run if it was, and, and even then it was only if it was less than 12 knots and, and upwind are okay, but reaching we'd, we'd romp away. And what, what was the mode you sailed downwind with a scow? Were you quite square running or did you have to get the bow up a bit? Uh, the scows were very dangerous in fresh breezes downwind. Uh, you could nose dive and cartwheel very easily, which is one of the reasons why my bows are so uh, hollow in the bow the, that kept the foredeck. By having it very hollow in the bow and a fairly high foredeck, you had less chance of getting water on top of the bow when you nose dived. Got you. So the boat you won the world championship in, you designed yourself, and that was the snobby yeah. design. Yeah, but it was. Um, I designed and built several before that, so it, it was the culmination of a lot of um, experience and experimentation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in this picture, it's the skiff moth that I borrowed in in USA. Oh, this sorry, I jumped on one. That one. That's. Uh, that picture, you, yeah, that one is a borrowed skiff that I had in USA. I was told it was going, wasn't going to be any wind, so there wasn't any point in taking a scow there. In the background on the left is John Claridge in the Magnum. Yeah, and so again, that's where the displacement boat won this world championship. Yeah, and my boat, I finished second um, in this borrowed boat. It was a displacement type um, hull as well. So, yeah. Uh, they were pretty, pretty quick boats. It was, the boat was pretty poorly built, but they were quite fast designs in those light, light conditions. Got you. We had one boat from Australia, one scow from Australia came, uh, David Martin, who's still sailing foiling moths now at Wallara. David brought his scow to, to uh, America, but um, he couldn't, couldn't compete really in the light winds. Yeah. And was it chalk and cheese then in the different conditions between a scow and a, and a skiff? Absolutely, All, always was Rob. Even yep. um, even in the uh, even in the eighties, I make the controversial. This will probably be a very debatable and controversial statement, but I think the scows would always be faster than a skiff. Even the low riding skiffs of the eighties um, and nineties, the scows would always be faster. Uh, if it was over 15 knots. The problem was with the scows that very few people were sailing them in the 80s and 90s and nearly all the good guys were on skiffs, so um, the skiffs ended up dominating. And, and, and I guess this, th these pictures here, you know, show the, the, the big difference between that scow bow, the big square flat hull and, and, and the skiff, much more of a, well, I mean, if you look at that picture on the right, it, almost looks like the bottom of a 49er. Yes, very similar actually, yeah. Yeah, very, uh, very similar to what, to what we see now uh, all around the stiff, And then the Magnums from the UK gradually got narrower and narrower until they became the, uh, the low riders that uh, Les is probably much more familiar with than I am. So Peter, you know, now we're at 1978 here, you never got into a skiff moth. You stayed Never, no, no, resident no, no. in the scow the whole time. I dropped out of moths in about 76, 77, 
Um, and I just built another one for the worlds that were in 78. Uh, that picture is quite interesting. It shows the, the scooped hollow tower that made the foredeck a bit higher. So there's less chance of the water getting on top of the bow and causing a nosedive. And also um, it's interesting to see that on the, on the right, we're using a, um, in the early days, the boom vangs were just uh, lashed down on the beach. You'd pull the main sheet on and lash the boom vang really tight. But uh, I can see in 78, we'd already moved to uh, adjustable boom vangs with a lever vang, which were pretty yeah. powerful. Plenty powerful. And do, do you think the scale was more popular Southern Hemisphere? More windy oh, conditions? I don't think there were any scales in Europe or America. Yeah. So literally it would be, you know, skiff style hulls, Northern Hemisphere in the lighter air conditions and, and scales in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah. I see that um, the Duflo skiff moth in uh, France won in 71 and 72. And then uh, uh, again in 76 in America. Yeah, got you. No, it's interesting. Well, Peter, we'll, we'll move on a few years now, but uh, thank you very much for chatting and, and we'll come back to you. Um, I think there's plenty of knowledge there, which uh, we definitely need to get it all down at some stage so that people, you know, so we can share it with everybody and people can uh, peruse back through the, uh, the years of moths. So uh, we'll, we'll jump on a few years now. Uh, Simon Payne, um, double world champion, but moth sailor since the early 80s. Um, this time from the other side of the world, Northern Hemisphere, UK based, and probably seeing it all in, in a different light. Uh, Simon probably was one of the people who were on the internet then, probably Instagramming exactly what was going on. So he would have known what was going on around the world. Um, but Simon, tell us about your early days of moth sailing um, from, uh, you know, from the lakes of the UK. Yeah, hi Rob. Um... Yeah, I had three three periods in moths. Really, I had a couple of years in the in the mid eighties, um, a couple of years in the early nineties, and then an extended period of kind of from two thousand and four to two thousand and twelve in in foiling boats. So quite a range. And and the picture in the middle is is uh, of my first moth, which was a Magnum Six, uh, built by. John Claridge, and you could buy them in kit form. Um, and, and that was at Alton Mere Sailing Club. And that really got me into it. They were fabulous little boats, so much quicker than anything else. But development was, was pretty rife then, actually. And it, it seemed like just as you finished off your, your first hull, you know, it was time for another one for the next year. And I mean, you know, John Claridge will know better, but I think there were 10 Magnum designs in total um, you know, and it, at that time, the Brits were kind of ruling the roost at world championship level with um, uh, Roger Angel and, and Toby Collier, particularly winning big world events. Um, and I think that was when the, the, the scales started to recede and we started to get the hang of sailing skiffs in a breeze as well. Um, so uh, yeah, that I, and I had a Magnum six and then a Magnum eight, and you know they were the the four decks were one and a half mil of Bishi ply. They were fragile boats that if you weren't careful, you could put your knee through on a capsize. And you know, to be honest, um, probably probably harder to sail than than some of the foiling boats we have today. Yeah, I mean, I, that's one thing I've heard that they were very hard to sail. Tell me how much you know. How much did a boat cost in those days? Was it was it a lot, or was it? You had if you had people to help you build it, you could. As an impecunious youth, you know, I had Roger Angel to help me build mine, and so that that was a great contributor. But I they they were not expensive, but they were a boat that you could finish off yourself. Uh, uh, and and then expect to be competitive uh, if you were a good sailor. Um, and and moving down to that that picture of the orange boat, that that's a skippy design, which was a Roger Angel boat. 
and that was probably as narrow as as they got um, and they had uh, foils but uh, wings I should say but the wings were on the back of the transom initially um, uh, to prevent nose diving um, and then they were if I recall correctly moved down onto the to the rudder so even in the early 90s we were starting to experiment with underwater sections to um, uh, it actually to provide the reverse of lift and drag the back down when you were going down when that okay. picture was at the Moth Worlds on Lake Macquarie in, uh, in the mid 90s um, and that was the world that Emmett Lazic won now, I think okay. I won only one race but that was the time where we were using um, still a bolt rope on the mainsail and the Aussies were mainly in skiffs, but they were using pocket loft sails, the, the early KA sails actually from Andrew McDougall. And right. it got above a certain wind strength and the, the Aussie boats were just, you know, on a reach so much quicker. Um, but, you know, again, big fleets, but, you know, I think actually if, if, if foiling probably hadn't come along, you know, they'd have probably been my last few years in a moth because I found them physically hard to sail. Um, and and when when foiling came along, you know they're, they're they're easier once you've got the controls sorted out. Physically, they're an easier boat. All right, this is probably a nice time to bring in Les. Um, you know, current moth sailor, moth sailor veteran in the class since '92. So Les, you obviously shared a bit of era in the low riding days with with Simon Payne. Um, yeah. Again, what it's, what's fascinating to me is, you know, Simon and Les, Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, and then you're, you're off away developing kits and then appearing every year at a championship um, or every other year and suddenly seeing who's got what kit. And um, Les, tell us about, you know, when you got into the class, obviously your brother was a huge builder. Um, of the uh, of the hungry tigers, which were a skiff type boat, and um, well, at first it was yeah. Not. So first, my first moth was a next slide was the, what we called the um, the gladiator skiffs, which were the fat skiffs. Um, that was one of my brother's old boats. Both my older brothers were in the class. That sort of was just a natural progression for me to join in. Um, it was sort of early nineties. That was ninety two when I got that, and. Um, I can remember the key, the, the top Aussie guys went over to the Worlds in Ratzeburg, Germany, and um, they thought they were going to win and were doing pretty well with their boats, similar to that one. And then um, the English guys sort of sailed over from a different beach on the practice day, did laps around them in these skinny little hulls and then sailed away and um, basically won the regatta 1-2. And then um, at the end, as the moth class was said, come and measure the boats and go back to Australia and build lots of them. And that was the birth of the um, Aussie Axe Band, which if you go back a slide is the uh, the boat on the right in that one there. So they were very common at the 95 worlds that Simon was speaking of. They were a narrow hull, about 300 mils on the waterline and a bit of square stern. Um, and then the development was into the rigs and the Australians were pushing the pocket luff sails. And that's one of the earlier pocket luffs there. That's at um, Early Beach, that photo. But, um, and then as Simon says, the 95 Worlds were starting to put t foil rudders to stop the nose diving downwind. And just basically the boats were getting narrower. Carbon fibre was becoming more popular and available. So the boats were getting lighter and narrower. And um, with that, the crew weights were going the optimum crew weights were going down. It's very similar to what um, Peter was saying. Um, so 95, you know, guys that were in their sort of mid 80 kilos were still competitive, but that gradually just plummeted as the boats got lighter and lighter. So um, like that boat on picture there, all up weight with the aluminium mast would have been 50, 60 kilos. But then this shot here with me and my brother in Japan nationals in 97, with Axeman hulls and everything carbon. So they were probably getting onto the water at mid to high 30 kilos. And then we just kept getting lighter and lighter from there down to, I think some of the, the tigers in the late nineties would have been under 30 kilos, everything on the water. So. And, and, you, and, and how were the numbers down. in the class? Was there plenty, me, of people, plenty of people saving still or were people now 
struggling and dropping there out? There were plenty of people sailing. We got 100 boats at the 95 Worlds, um, 98 in the UK. I think there was about 75 boats. So there's still people in the class, but it was diminishing. It was... Um, was becoming less that sort of home build. You, could, you couldn't just build yourself a boat in winter. You were the, all, all the boats were now professionally built either in the UK or, or by Mark in Australia. And that sort of quality of build was going up, but that was making it less available to, to the, the standard person. Um, cost was going up, I guess. But um, I think the biggest thing that was reducing the numbers was the crew weights going down and Mark became sort of one of the, um, well, he won three worlds, but he was only 65 kilos where, you know, right. I was doing my best to stay in the low 70s sort of thing. So um, that's Lake Macquarie, probably just the start of when the foilers were turning around. That's a Hungry Tiger hull, which was the dominant design before we went foiling. So um, Mark had built, you know, probably 100 or so of those that went around the world. Um, yeah. And that that would that was the boat to have by mid nineties, was it? Late nineties was the, the tiger was ninety eight, so that was sort of ninety eight to early two thousands was yeah, it was basically tigers or prowlers from um, John in, in WA. And what was the northern hemisphere putting out at this stage? Uh, it's typical like the bit like the the, the skippy. Um, I'm just trying to remember what. Uh, UK version of the design was, but it was very similar. The Tiger was a um, kind of an evolution of the Aussie Axeman and the UK boat at the time. Yeah, we had the, uh, we had a, 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 the Magnums were still going, the Skippy, and then we had um, the, uh, uh, the Blood Axe boat that Andy Patterson built, which was the, the Axeman. Uh, and there were yeah. a number of, um, a number of builders there but it, I think this was a time when the class was probably starting to just start to get a little smaller as it was it was harder for any home builders to to keep up um, yeah. and the degree of difficulty of competing meant that you, you know often you had to buy a boat from another country uh, and it was at the time where where maybe some of the the RS boats were coming coming on with easy in you know, finance options and sailing kind of got a whole lot easier in other areas. And I think that mm. the class probably just got eaten away a little bit. Um, but there was a hardcore few. I mean, certainly in the UK, we did go down to quite small open meetings. Um, uh, you know, and, and I guess I think it was kind of fortunate that at, at, at that time, foiling started to come along and it was the impetus to, yeah. class to go to the next yeah. level. I agree with that. Like, so I was, um, so I'll just tell you, I'm sorry. Oh, like, so I think what that evolution, which was actually killing us off, sort of, you know, not many adult males are sort of sub 70 kilos. That was killing us off, but it was actually what opened up for because the boats were so light, and the crews were so light. It made the boats relatively easy to lift out of the water and then sort of evolve back the other way. So yeah, at the time we had, we were getting sort of 45 boats at the national titles in Australia, but most of those were from New South Wales. So, you know, we were kind of, most of our discussions were, how do we get more people in the class? How do we not sort of basically die? So, yeah. and, and it was essentially expense and crew weight. The boat had become, you had to be 65 kilos and yeah. uh, the development was always still there and there, were, and there were complicated boats. Yeah, and it was relatively difficult to sail. Yeah, you couldn't just jump on it and be competitive in a week or two. So it had to take a few months to get into it. So, yeah. All right. Well, that's quite a nice sort of lead into Rowan. Um, so, Rowan, um, thanks for joining us. And you came and stepped into the class just at a, well, kind of the perfect time, maybe, for, um, for what you did in it and got out of it. Um, foiling was just about it, you know, was, was, was just starting. Tell us a Tell us a bit about your journey and uh, when you got into the class and then, and then what happened over the next couple of years. Yeah, I, I got in, well, I always admired the moth sailors. I always looked up to them and I was, they were my heroes. Uh, when I was a teenager um, sailing sabots in 420s and as soon as I uh, finished five years of university, the first thing I did was went and bought a moth and I bought a Wombat 84 
Um, and that, but that photo on the left there of Steve Schimmel, who was a world champion um, from Australia, that I had that picture on my wall for years when I was a teenager and he was my hero. Um, but yeah, when I finished uni, I bought a Wombat 84 hull, which was a fat wide skiff. And um, I used to just go down to Albert Park Lake and every day I'd go out, I'd break something. And it was um, frustrating, but I kept setting myself goals to you know actually finish a race and then, um, yeah, just actually try and do something. But uh, if you go back one slide, it, I, there was another guy, and you can, yeah, this is the, my second boat on the left. That's an Aussie Axeman um, that actually won, Phil Hebden won the Nationals on 94, 95, I think. And, but if you go to the next slide, you can see um, there was another Moss Allen, Mick Booty. He's in the top, his boat's in the top uh, of the photos there. He used to say, he and I were sailing at the lake together. It was just the two of us. Basically, we were the only two in Victoria sailing. And he was so much faster. And so I bought one of those boats as well. And we could go sailing together and there's, um, at a similar speed. But he had a wing on the bottom of the rudder um, to prevent you going nose diving downhill. And, um, and that's where I sort of got, got the bug very quickly uh, from there. I just wanted to go sailing every single weekend whenever possible. Uh, and then obviously this whole, this whole foiling thing came about and you were sort of one of the first people to jump on that bandwagon. I mean, I don't think we can credit you with starting it. Obviously, these the guys in WA, uh, the, you know, Brett Burville, John Eilert, Tell us, tell us what happened and talk us through these photos here. Uh, well, the very first um, person to go foiling on a moth was Frank Raisin, and they're the two photos on the left there. That was in the early 70s um, down here in Victoria, and it's really hard to see. Looking, It's like, you know, someone taking a photo of a UFO. <clears throat> um, it's quite blurry and, but, um, and quite elaborate, the setup that he had there, but it had some sort of ladder foil arrangement there. And I actually met him, and yeah, he was the first. Um, and then the top cent, uh, in the centre there is Andy Patterson. He was falling in the mid '90s, I believe, with um, some sort of T-fold arrangements off his wings and bow and rudder, and yeah, that he 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 was more experimentation than anything. Um, and then Ian Ward as well. He's in the top right. He was falling on a scow with a canard at the bow. Um, but my main um, motivation and inspiration for foiling was Brett Burville, who was in the bottom uh, centre there. He was sailed the 99, 2000 worlds in Perth on that boat there. Um, that was just crazy. And I just, I was, he was my hero from then on. And and I wanted to to basically go foiling, but at the bottom right photograph is Garth Eilert, and him and his brother John Eilert were developing these prowler moths that were low riding, but with foils. And that photo there shows a surface piercing foiler um, mounted off the wings and bow uh, with a T4 rudder that sort of worked quite well. But uh, that Brett's design was deemed, and this. But photo that John and Garth, uh, or you say Garth sailing there, that that type of arrangement there was deemed illegal because you, you, there was an air gap dividing the boat longitudinally. Um, so I had to come up with a better way how to go foiling. So and these guys in Perth, they were they were the best. They were the most creative. Um, so on the photo on the top right there, you can see that was the same boat that Garth was using in that last photograph called on the prow. But um, Brett, both Brett and John developed a T-fall system using a, a wing on the bottom of the centreboard and, a, and a, obviously a wing on the back of the rudder to lift the boat clear of the water that was legal in the class views. Um, but one of the things Brett did initially, and I haven't got a photo of it, but he had, a, he had two wing two wings on his centerboard and one was to get the boat out of the water and one was to keep it flying um, but the most creative thing he did he put a piano hinge on the back of the t4 rudder and put a flap on the back that he could twist his tiller extension and adjust the the trim 
or the pitch of the boat, I should say. But with the two falls on the centre board, it kept jumping up and down a bit too much. So um, that was when John came up with this system of the top right there with a sensor on the bow and a, and a Morse cable running down across the boat and a push rod down to the, another flap on the back of the centre board. And that was the game changer. So after I won the Nationals in 2002, I think, I just said, I'm doing this. I flew straight over the Perth. And that was a photo of me sailing on Garth's boat um, to test it out. But Garth and Brett were both using a similar system at that same Nationals, but didn't have much success with it. And I had a gut feeling. I knew it was good, but I had a gut feeling. I think I thought it was due to the sail. I didn't think the sail had enough leech tension to get enough pressure to get the height upwind because they were basically reaching upwind and they just couldn't get anywhere. Downwind, they were pretty quick, um, but just not consistent enough. So I took one of my KA sails over there was had a much stiffer leech and I, I could get a lot more height to windward. And in that photo there on the top right, just reaching around, it, it was quick. And so I ordered a boat straight away. Um, and that boat uh, was called White Knuckle Express. And, and that boat is photographed there in the in the middle there that was I basically used it I think once or twice before going to the worlds in France 2003 and that photo um, it was taken by a local there and was put over the magazines all over the world because I ended up getting third there but it was very difficult to sail I had to learn how to sail the boat at the world championships and but one of the key things that I learned is to heal the boat over to weather upwind and get the confidence in the rig and get pressure off the leech to get that height. And that was that was it um, yeah. to, to learn how to sail that wind. But the other so one was... I, I, sorry, at your regattas in Australia, you were showing up then in with this boat with foils on? And well, not really, because I only had one weekend, like Scott Babbage and I drove from up to Queensland to sail on a state championships. And I, that was it. That was the only weekend I had to sail it we didn't have enough wind to even go foiling. And I was the only one doing it then. And then I had yeah. to drive back down to Sydney and put the boat in a container and send it to France. I had like five days before the world championships to learn how to sail this boat. Um, but one of the things that I thought was cool um, was I thought, I wonder if you could actually jive this thing in the air. And I learned how to do that over there as well. And that was like, it was amazing. It was a, a, a really critical point in time because it hadn't been done before and I just thought I, I just kept setting myself these goals and challenges see can I actually do this can I get to windward um, in that that world though the another big issue we had was jellyfish and you can imagine going downwind doing 15 to 20 knots back then and hitting this jellyfish that weighs like five kilos and you just catapult off the boat that happened multiple times and it was but it, it wasn't the reason why I didn't win it was, it was just I was just still learning um, so on the left there that's another um, the same boat but I, I was still unsure about you know whether I was allowed to whether it was better to go foiling or not foiling so I had a, a different rudder and a standard centerboard that I could need to change of the boat to, to, to work out what was the best configuration and that rudder there was quite experimental as well you can see the wings halfway up but the key thing with that one it had a flap on the back of the wing that we could adjust the pitch of the boat as well. But it, it worked to a certain extent, but really the foiling, I just said, no, I've got to commit to this because I didn't like switching between foiling and non-foiling in races or regattas because you just didn't learn enough. So I just said from then on, I'm not changing. I'm 100% committed to this. I'm going to make it work. And then, um, yeah, you can see in that bottom right photograph, um, that was um, taken at Geelong Week against the 100 footer there next to it. but that's when I started, you can see me starting to heal over the weather there. I mean, yeah, it was game over from there, basically, as far as I'm concerned, because I just learned how to sail it. But you can see the head of the mainsail there has been, it, it, we used to have a large, um, big headed mains, but we had to cut them down because they were over the eight metre square rule. So we had to chop off about 0.25 or 0.3 of a metre off the head and make it a bit smaller to get inside the eight square metres at that stage. Yeah, and, and did you feel you were alienating yourself a bit out of the class or? Oh, definitely, I wasn't popular yeah. at all. I mean, I was, a, I was the only one and I had, the only support I had was from Brett and 
Garth really, and Andrew McDougall to a certain extent, he was out of the class then, but I had to force him to help me design sales to make this thing work. And so we'd sit there. That sale on the left, believe it or not, is the only sale that Andrew actually made himself ever in his life. Um, he and you know, I made that together you know, over a few weeks, but he's never actually sewn a sale up other than that, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. And um, Les, I just want to ask you right now, you at this sort of time, Rowan's obviously out there getting foiled and getting on the front of magazines. You were Australian class president. Um, what, what was the vibe and what was the feel? Well, it was, it was odd. So that world from the front of the thing, that was, it was me and Mark that were one, two in the, in the Tigers. And it was, um, so it was sort of the old and the new. And to go on something Rowan said, like to watch him try and make a decision on whether he low rode or foiled was looked extremely stressful from my position. So I think when Rowan said he made that decision to foil all the time, that was the game changer because um, he obviously went away and sailed it in all conditions. And that's when the foiling really started to, to be far more dominant than anything else. Um, the feeling was that a lot of people felt that I was, I, I was against foiling because I just didn't want the moth class to die. People were saying things, it was because my brother was building the boats and the like. I mean, if you know my relationship with my brother, it didn't really cross my mind at all. Um, it was just, I was already seeing the numbers coming down and, and um, I just thought, if we halve the numbers again, we're, we're done, right? So it was, um, Rowan said he wasn't popular. It wasn't anything to do with Rowan. It was just um, the worry that we're gonna sort of develop ourselves into oblivion. But um, thankfully, Falls were kind of available and the sort of mid-fleet guys started to buy falls as well after watching Rowan and Simon and those guys have so much fun. Um, and then it became a sort of a real tough battle to try and actually get falls because they weren't something you could build yourself. Um, so there was a period there where it was actually, you know, John was building as many boats and falls as he could, but there was a, there were more people wanting them than could get them. Um, so there was a period for me where I was still low riding, struggling to get foils. I had them ordered in a couple of places, but couldn't get them. And um, my brother had chosen to sort of move on from the class. And so I was low riding around and watching these falling boats whiz back and forwards. And you know, Rowan and Simon would sort of be gone and you'd never see them again. But uh, the guys that were learning were sort of with me and it was sort of, I guess I was the benchmark. If you didn't beat me, you weren't going faster on foils, but um, it took a while. And then once we all had those converted boats, that sort of it's, that's when the development really took off. Yeah, got you. And Simon then, Northern Hemisphere, you were out the class for a few years, then you sort of, obviously, I'm sure you were very attached to the class still and were in touch with the politics and you saw this sort of foiling emerging. What, um, you know, where did it, what, what possessed you to get back into it and how did it all, how did it all go? When I went to those worlds that Rowan sailed in France the first time on foils, and I hadn't met Rowan then, and um, I took a Skippy 2, which on the face of it wasn't a great idea. Um, and the first night I got there late and I slept on the canvas of a Hobie Cat in the dinghy park, and, the, and, and when I woke up in the morning, my shoes had gone. So, you know, it, 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 the event wasn't starting well, because... <laughs> many things to wear and I was also in a skippy too where which was never going to be competitive but but then I, I, I saw Rowan and I started to I started to understand what the future could be and there were still question marks about whether the boat was legal it, it was a period of managing change and actually the class was for, fortunate enough to have a, a great class president, Mark Robinson, who, who handled it well. And we got kind of pretty much the whole ship turning in the way we wanted. You know, some people adopted it earlier, some, some, some later. But I went ahead uh, as soon as I got back and uh, ordered a boat from John Islet. Uh, and I think that's the one you can see on, on the left. You know, and at the time, if you wanted to do any good, you know, you needed a faster craft prowler and there were they, they had, there were a couple of iterations, basically John over the years made the hull more shallow, the, the freeboard less because you didn't need it when you were in the air, but you can kind of see the relationship between that boat on the left 
you know, and some of the early skiffs that that Les was low riding in, there wasn't really that much difference. The, 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 the boat was the same. And in fact, I think in the Prell, there even won uh, races as, as a low rider before it was put on foils. But the build quality was, was, was staggering. It, it was jewel-like brilliance. And so I had one, the only one in the UK, and I remember going out at Hailing Island with a balcony full of, uh, of club members, you know, hundreds, and, and, and immediately doing the biggest nosedive. Um, and I thought, well, that, 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 that's a good way to start. And, you know, and compared to the foilers now, they were, they were harder to handle, you know. They, they, they lifted early, they had big foils, um, quite a big draft on the foil, so early kind of heavy lift type type boats, but hard to force through the air. And, you know, we had the 20 knot club. I don't know when any of the guys can remember that, where it was pretty rare to break 20 knots. Uh, and going downwind there, it wasn't necessarily a case of how fast you got to the windward mark. It was, you know, it was whether, uh, sorry, to the leeward mark. It, it, was, it was whether you got to the leeward mark because everything used to bend and the wand uh, was really just a batten that bent if you nosedive too hard. So you'd be running up and down the wing but it taught you a lot about sailing. And if you're a seat of a pants type of sailor, uh, I mean, I had the, the, the benefit of, um, you know, seeing Rowan and, uh, and, and that was sensational in the, in, the, in the dinghy world. And I remember Rowan coming over to the dinghy exhibition and signing posters. And, and I haven't seen it since, you know, even with all the medals that the Brits have won at the Olympics, a line of people and he's signing posters that said the Lord of the Wings. I mean, it was, I could see it was, it, it, it was uh, sensational um, and you know and I never looked back and I, I, I went through you know prowlers and then was very you know pleased to be associated with Andrew when we did the Mac 2 um, but by 2012 I, I you know I was running out of gas I was running out of weight um, and uh, and I won my last race in, in 2012 and I knew that would be the last last event I'd ever sail but yeah I still think about coming back only <laughs> and Les, from from the sort of the low riding point of view, on the politics, obviously at some stage, and in fact, all, you know, Les, Simon, and Rowan all jump in here. There were four foiling boats at one event in Europe, and then at some stage, it was decided to make it legal. How did how did it all happen? And you know, well, it's, no, it's not. It's not. I'll just. Fix your words a little bit. It was not make it legal. It was decided to not make it illegal. Because oh, yeah. the model is always everything's legal until you sort of show it's not like, really. Like it's very, we try and have minimal rules. And that was sort of my take. So um, Mark Robinson was very helpful as a world president. Um, at the time, as Australian president, I, yeah, everyone, I had people in the boat park saying, got to make this illegal. And then I turn around someone and say, you can't make it illegal. Right? And it's sort of, it was divisive at the time the very early stages, but um, did a simple vote across Australia and just said, do you want to ban foiling? That was the question. And everyone's going, oh, but how are we going to do it? I said, no, 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 it's, let's just see what the answer is. And it, it was almost the worst result ever. It came back 50-50. So because of the way our constitution was, it was on states. So that it was, um, it was um, three states voted not to ban it and one state was... Um, had two votes and it was one for and one against. So it was unanimous to, to not ban it. But um, in the actual raw numbers, it was 50-50, which was frightening to me because it meant that we we're just halving the class straight away. But yeah. thankfully, um, you know, my opinion at the time was was wrong, obviously, because with um, the class has gone in leaps and bounds since. Yeah. And Simon, in the in the UK then, what was what was the chat? People were into it or...? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think the thing to point out, you know, we kind of, the, the lucky few who had the boats and, you know, and, and were, were learning it. Yeah, I mean, at this time, sailing them was, your freestyle, if you like, was as much fun as racing. As, as Rowan said, you'd learn, to, you'd learn to, to jive on the foils and stuff. But I think everybody was really mindful of the fact that you needed to let people have a go. So you know, I think what was a feature at many of these events was, was between races and after races, people were getting in these boats, which, which you know, we cared for and we, we tuned and, and going sailing and, get, and getting, 
uh, the feeling of foiling. Uh, so, and I think that brought a lot of the, 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 the others onwards. And here in the UK, you know, we, we had an, uh, um, uh, some UK builders as well, uh, which probably didn't match the, uh, you, know, you know, the sophistication, maybe not sophistication, it's not the right word, but the success of the prowler, but provided good competitive local builds. And, and as Rowan pointed out, you know, it, it, um, sorry, as Les pointed out, the issue was getting the kit. So it took a few years for everybody to get it. But I think by, you know, I think by 2006, everybody bar a couple of people who probably didn't, weren't that concerned, were on foils. Yeah. It's on my first foiling experience was on your boat, the 04 Worlds in Melbourne. You yeah. said, go. Oh. And I got on and it was awesome. So. Yeah, I remember that photo on the left there from the 2005 Worlds in Melbourne. And I mean, a clear indication of how much fun it was that the last race after the Worlds, uh, all five of us are on four, stayed out after the last race for an hour to, just to let other yep. people have a go on the boat and just and have some was, fun. Yeah. And that was crucial, I believe. Like that, that, that was a, an, another turning point. It, it sort of made it more available for everyone. And, and, yeah. and I think Simon and yeah. I, we felt as though that was the only way we could convince people, give, us, give them a go on the boat and see what it's like. And we, we, we hated it, but we had to do it because we didn't want anyone breaking our boats, especially during the middle of a regatta. But we did it because that's how we had to get people on these boats to convince yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. All right. And then, um, Rowan, obviously things evolved and then you, you pushed the, the, the production route with the Blade Rider, and which essentially uh, was the first production foiler other than the the, uh, the John Islet boats, which I'm not going to call, I don't know if he'd call them production boats as opposed to sending custom boats. Yeah, so John was building about 10 or 12 a year, but basically as soon as you got one, I put an order in straight away for my next one. I had to wait nine months to get it, but I was turning over a boat every six to nine months um, just because there was another reason for that. I could afford to do it, but I had to put the boats back in the fleet and they were set up, so it helped build the numbers. Um, so we all agreed to do that. Simon, Mark, Adam, you know, um, we all we all did that. And then, yeah, I was approached by an investor and, and Andrew McDougall to uh, start Blade Rider, basically and go mass production. And that's the boats on the right there, at the and the Garter Worlds, which I um, which I won. And we had I don't know how many boats we had there. It's probably seventy or sixty or something like that. But um, they were pretty dominant then. Um, ended up building 260, 270, but that helped get the numbers out there on the water. And by then YouTube was around and I started, I was putting up a lot of videos and that got the, got people into it as well. And they, that's when the internet mothy started, but some people actually committed, bought a boat and learned how to sail it. And, you know, without even realizing what I was doing, I was motivating other people to do the same as what Steve Schimmel did for me. And so, yeah, that just sort of evolved from there. And I guess the Blade Rider was, a, you know, was successful for a few years, but just the evolution we're seeing that we were seeing in the class at that stage, sort of put it out of date, probably quicker than it, it could have been. Yeah, it's pretty normal. You can look back through every design over the years. You probably, you know, a design's only ever dominant for about five years until something else better comes along. And yeah. um, so then, you know, Andrew, he went off and did his own thing with the Mac Two. Um, and that's uh, about to be when I, I'd been in it for about eight or nine years and I'd had enough. And uh, That photo on the bottom right is uh, with of, they're all the, the world championships that were present, present at the 2016 Moth Worlds in Sorrento, I think, um, which was a crazy regatta. Very windy, difficult, 160-something boats. Um, but, yeah, a lot of fun. And it was just good to be sailing amongst, you know, such awesome sailors as well. Yeah, I mean... The, the the big question obviously is you know how much of what went on in that early part of the moth foiling is you know has resulted in what we're seeing on the water today with foiling America's Cup and all of that I don't think we can say it was all about moth class and and uh, and you know ten individuals around the world a bunch being WA and and a bunch of you guys online here um, but I'm sure it, it certainly shaped 
the same we do today quite a lot. And I think there's, you know, probably sailing owes a pretty big debt of gratitude to a, to a bunch of people here that's really uh, transform, transform sailing as we know it. And um, I'm sure it's been a lot of hard work over the years to get it there. Yeah, I think one so, of the key things was that um, it allowed, um, like us by giving people these a go on our boats, they were Olympic sailors, you know, Volvo Ocean sailors, whatever. It just gave them a taste as well. How good is this? And then they apply that to their own uh, sort of boats and, and just sort of went from there. Rowan, fantastic. Thank you. Peter, just want to come back to you briefly before we say goodbye. 73 years old. I don't know if, I, you know, if that, that's public now. Um, <laughs> world champion, 1975. You know, you're back out there now, got back into the class in the last few years, and how are you enjoying it? <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome. Um, can't believe it. It's uh, just the most amazing sensation. Um, and uh, it's a struggle, I must say. Um, you know, you, you have these little, little uh, challenges that try to try to learn to stay on it without falling off and then uh, try to master jibing. That took me a year. And uh, now I, I've been trying desperately for two years and I'm not even close to foil tacking. So uh, that's the next challenge. I'd like to be able to foil tack before I... Uh... It's all in boat set up, Pete. I keep telling you. <laughs> it's, um, but it keeps you young and it keeps you fit. And uh, it's just fantastic. I always thought in the 70s that the moth the Moth was the nicest boat to sail. I've, I've sailed a lot of different sorts of boats and um, it's, it's just a lovely boat to sail then and it is now. Uh, the only boat that comes close to it in my mind is a 14 foot skiff, which I sailed for about 10 years. That high power to weight ratio, high performance boats are, are just great fun. And the foiling is just awesome. And any advice to anyone thinking of jumping in? <laughs> yeah, give it. Give it a go. It's just, uh, once you get up on those foils, it's just an amazing feeling. It's silent and, and you way above the spray. It's, it's just, a, just an incredible feeling. And boy, they just go so fast. I got up to 27 knots the other day and I, I think, well, I don't want to go any faster than that. that that'll, that'll do me. <laughs> Maybe you've got to do foil tacks and 30 before you're done. <laughs> No, I don't, I don't. I don't even think foil tacking's on the on the radar. It just seems to be completely and physically impossible. Yeah. I don't know how anyone can do it. Yeah. Okay, Les, you've been there, been in the class now for you know well over twenty years. Um, you've 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 low rided, you've foiled. What's your favourite bit? And um, you know, you're obviously clearly into the foiling now. Oh, look, I've always loved the class. Um, Originally, it was the challenge. They were difficult boats to sail. They were quick boats, but not, you know, lightning fast than everything else. But, um, I mean, what I sort of learned in the transition period is, like, whether I'm racing for first or 51st or 101st, I just enjoy racing moths with other people. And um, that's what keeps me coming back. So you just find your own little battles. And, um, yeah, there's a few guys in the fleet that I'm usually battling with. You know, like a fleet of 100, but I'm really only racing four or five of them sort of thing, right? So... It's just that um, there's always the camaraderie in the class and it's just great fun. And as Simon said, just going sailing on your own in a moth is fun. It's just, the foiling is awesome. It's the best thing that ever happened to us. And um, it also enables you to keep sailing moths for, for longer. If, if we were still low riding, I would have to give up ages ago. And do you feel as you, you're as competitive now as you were when you were 25 sailing them? I'm as competitive in my mind as I was, but um, yeah. I'm not as successful. But, uh, <laughs> no, look, it's, um, it's the same as always. It's, it's sort of, um, yeah, you've got to put the time in and time is my uh, most valued commodity at the moment. So, look, yeah. I'm, my days of winning a World Park, um, yeah, I still feel I can give most people a shake. So, Good. just get it time to go. Simon, are we going to see you back? Yes. Um, uh, Rowan and I did talk briefly about some form of comeback that didn't involve any training and just buying a boat. 
<laughs> and then selling it immediately afterwards. Um, I, I don't know, when I, when I hear Les uh, and I hear Peter um, talking about foiling, I've done a lot of miles on foils, more than, more than many, any. But um, I, I'm still reminded of that, that, that feeling. Um, but I, I don't miss the racing. I, I, miss, I miss the, the friends I made. Uh, who live in countries, um, uh, well, here, but also, you know, I don't visit so much anymore because I don't race. It's a long-winded answer, Rob, but maybe. Yeah, well, it would be great to see you back in the class. Certainly, uh, you know, certainly one, you know, as someone who's been present in the class for a long time and missed. Rowan, what about you? Any thoughts of a little return? No, I'll never say no. I, I, I said no at the 2016 Worlds until AMAC said, oh, yeah, I've got a spare boat. Do you want to use it? I go, all right. But that's it. There won't be any training or anything like that at yeah. the moment. Um, yeah, there's other things with my business and yeah. Uh, yeah, kill boats and stuff. But once you sail them off, you can't go back to anything else. It's as simple as that. And uh, any sailing in the other dinghy is just boring. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, thank you very much. Thank you for all your time and thank you listeners for listening. Um, one thing is there is a lot of history in this class. We're very lucky and um, we do need to try to uh, document it all properly and put in all the bits we've missed, um, you know, an ebook or something so that we can, uh, you know, look back through the years and see how we got to where we've got to and why. So thank you all for joining and um, until next time, thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Bye. Bye.